It's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the co-chairs of Arizona's Bioscience and Healthcare Caucus at the Arizona Legislature, Representatives Daniel Hernandez and Justin Wilmoth. So first of all, again, I want to deeply share my appreciation with our patients and their families and everyone that has been with us today and everyone that's going to be watching online. Um, because the voice of the patient is very, very important. But what's more important is what happens when we listen. Um, so you know, just to get things started, they know who I am, um, but Daniel, who are you? Uh, well, thank you so much, Joan. Uh, my name is Daniel Lidnandes. Um, I am a retiring uh, member of the legislature. Lucky. I've, spent, I've spent the last six years uh, rep representing Southern Arizona, and before that served as a school board member. So I'm actually finishing my 11th year of public service down in Southern Arizona. Um, but a few years ago, the folks at Dorn Policy Group and AZ Bio came to me and said, we have this crazy idea of having legislators interact with the life sciences, with patients. Can we work on creating a bioscience caucus? And my first co-chair was a former legislator named Jay Lawrence, and then the pandemic started. So we did exactly one meeting <laughs> in person before the pandemic started, and now We've been lucky enough to have my colleague, uh, Representative Wilmeth, who used to be a House staffer, um, join us. So I'm really excited, and I'll hand it off to Justin to introduce himself. So I guess I need to talk about myself here, huh? Okay, so Justin Wilmeth, um, finishing up one term of maybe more um, in the legislature. New district is LD2, so if you live north of Thunderbird between the 51 and 17, please vote for me. Um, <laughs> I did used to be a House staffer. I was also a staffer in Oklahoma. I've been involved in politics in some way for 18 years. So I have a decent idea on how to get stuff done. I had 18 bills signed into law my first, my first term. So happy to be a part of this and uh, drive it forward in the future, hopefully. We're not going to let you get away, Justin. I, I'm stuck, right? It's like a You're Godfather stuck. three. They pull me back in. <laughs> so... For those of us that don't hang around the legislature, what exactly is a caucus? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways that the word is used. So there's the Republican caucus, there's the Democratic caucus, which is the official caucus of both parties. But then we also have formed special groups that meet together, usually based around either an idea or a concept or an identity. Um, so there's the Latino caucus, which meets for Latino members or members who represent districts that have over a 60% Latino population. And then with us, we opened it up to everybody so that any legislator who wanted to learn more about the Arizona biosciences industry and also um, hear directly from patients, we were able to come in and bring in speakers. So when we're using the word caucus, we don't mean Democrat or Republican, we mean everybody who wants to learn more about the way that this is impacting the state of Arizona. Yeah, in this context, the caucus could mean anything. There's a rural caucus, there's a veterans caucus, there's a people in the East Valley caucus, probably. I don't, I don't know what they do out there. So that's all it means in this context. So um, when we came together, and, and it's my privilege to be the admin support for the caucus. So this is their caucus. They run it. They decide what they want to learn about. And then I have to coordinate it and get the food. That's the key part. If you want any legislative attention <laughs> during session, they need to feed us, which it's, it's a bit of a joke, but our schedules are so wild, putting in 50, 60 hours a week at the legislature, we literally don't have time to get away for lunch, so we're very appreciative of that. It's kind of like doing stuff on a college campus where if you give out free food, people are more likely to show up, so it sounds silly, but a lot of these caucuses actually have like brown bag lunches where you'll have a presenter come in and speak and as much as I want to say we had people show up and listen to everything the reality is you'd have members who'd come in 10 minutes listen get the paperwork and then leave with their little sack lunch so that was one of the reasons why we had to make sure we had dynamic speakers um, because the more engaging the speakers are the more likely members are to say, okay, I'm only going to go for 10 minutes, but they show up, they start listening, and they're like, actually, I'm going to just stay here a little longer. Okay. And in a, 
an era where we hear so much about polarization. Um, you know, I think one of the most powerful things that I saw this year was um, the very first caucus meeting of the year. We had Dr. Lee come in from SonoraQuest and teach the legislators what biomarkers are. And it was standing room only, and they were really interested. And, um, and then Representative Cobb um, dropped House Bill 2144, which is the biomarker bill we talked about earlier, where in Arizona, if you are covered by Medicaid, private insurance, your own private insurance, small group plans, or the state health care plans and, and county plans. Um, now, if your doctor says you need a biomarker test and the science and the regulatory science supports that, your insurance has to pay for it. And that was a pretty complicated bill that certain parts of the healthcare ecosystem was not real keen on. And, um, but you then invited Karen Knutson, head of the American Cancer Society, to talk to the, the caucus. And what was that like? Well, I mean, it was phenomenal, and it was a backstop to what we had had before that. It, every legislator comes from different fields, and we have to deal with three million topics every, every spring and we're supposed to know what we're doing, and that's very challenging because we're all politicians first. So um, there's a lot of topics we don't know a lot about. We have our two or three areas that maybe we grew up with, or we have a knowledge base in, or that's our career. And then the rest, we're kind of flying blind, with the exception of meetings like ours and lunches like ours. And so that was a great secondary kind of a booster rocket to the first one that you were talking about because it provided more information, and it shared with the members how important this field is and how amazing it could be that if we're in a position to find out what people might be getting, how we can have preventative maintenance for that and avoid it altogether, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And I would just say, I think it was a really interesting thing because for biomarkers, we had a lot of interest because people didn't really understand what that meant. Whereas with cancer, it was a little bit different because everyone knows somebody that's had cancer. So it was a little bit easier to kind of personalize it and to kind of imagine like, how did this impact me? How did this impact my family, my community? And I think when we're looking at legislation, I've been doing advocacy for 14 years. This is my 14th legislative session. What I always tell people is numbers and data are great things, but they are just tools. The things that are important are stories. So that's where having the ability to have the data is always great. So she came in and provided a lot of data. But then the conversations that came up afterwards about people saying, well, my father had X kind of cancer. My aunt had this kind of cancer allowed us to keep having conversations. So it was a good catalyst for the conversation to start and then keep going because they didn't just learn about a new topic or new data. They were able to say, okay, how did this personally impact me? And when you can get legislators, unfortunately, to think about how did this impact me and my family or my family or uh, community, it's a little bit easier to get them to understand why it's an urgent need. So that's why I always appreciate AZ Bio's work to bring in stories and to bring in folks who are patients who are actually dealing with some of the topics that we're talking about. Because then it's not just like an abstract idea that's on paper somewhere. It's not just a bill. It's I had to look you in the eye and tell you why I'm voting no or why I'm voting yes on a specific piece of legislation. Well, and that's, and that's a great point because in every topic you can imagine that you've ever heard on the news or you know different groups are going to give us these things called one-pagers, which is a bunch of <clears throat> dry statistical information that's important. It's important. I like your one-pagers. But <laughs> Um, how do we differentiate that? And that is those stories, that is those meetings, and that's, once you can personalize it, everybody needs to know how it affects them. You know, and that's the big challenge that we have. Absolutely, and you know, it's interesting when, you know, I'm in the legislature, I see so many of our patient groups being actively engaged and coming and speaking with the elected leaders and sharing their stories and, and it does make a huge difference in not just getting their attention, but touching them. It was interesting. Um, Senator Gowan was at the AZ Bio Awards on Wednesday evening. And he talked about 
how he was brought into understanding the importance of the life sciences and the healthcare and the biosciences in Arizona when he was at TGen and he heard one of the patients at TGen tell a, ta a, a patient story. And um, thanks to the work of, of Senator Gowan and our caucus members and everyone else at the legislature, um, this year Arizona put into law the Arizona Health Innovation Trust Fund, which they've now seeded and will continue to fund and grow, um, that will then support developing life science innovation, patient innovation in Arizona forever. And I want to thank you guys because including the $100,000 appropriation that went into that to seed it, it actually went to, into effect on my birthday. So that was, <laughs> that was an awesome birthday, birthday present. Thank you. <laughs> we got you uh, funding. <laughs> yes. Um, now, now can, can we put three more zeros after that next year? Please, uh, please, Daniel? please. <laughs> no, I'm yes, not going to be there. That's <laughs> not going to be my job. I'm still in the majority, so I guess I have to deal with that. <laughs> yep. And... I would say one other thing that's really important about you all sharing your stories is don't just wait until the legislative session has started. Um, the legislative session moves very, very quickly. We start in January, and the last two years are the exception to the rule, but generally about 100 days is what happens. So from start to end, 100 days or less. So don't wait until January 30th to reach out to us for the first time. Reach out to us now. I, I think one of the things that people don't understand and realize is that we live in your communities. I'm in Phoenix a couple times a week during the legislative session, but the rest of the time I'm down in Tucson. So if you ask me to meet you um, for a cup of coffee or ask us to meet in our offices, we will meet with you, and I actually would rather meet with you and talk to you for half an hour than just get an angry email the day before a bill is up and hear for you for the first time saying, you better vote on this bill or else. Um, so building those relationships is really crucial and not waiting until just the last minute I think is really important because then when I'm looking to talk to somebody about a bill or something that's tangentially related, I can say, oh, I'm going to call Joan. And if Joan doesn't know who I can talk to, then she'll say, but let me connect you to this other person. And it's all about being able to have those resources as legislators. Because like Justin said, we have very limited amount of time, but we have a ton of different topics that are being thrown at us constantly that we are not subject matter experts on. And the, the thing I would add to that is that we have these pesky things called elections every two years, and we're weeks away from the next one, pretty big one. And so I would say that to say that people that are running for office, if you reach out to them and say, hey, I want to meet and talk about issue X, they're going to do it. If, if they want to have a chance to come back, if they want to be seen as relatable, this is the year to do it. This is the time of year to do it because we're all on hair triggers trying to get mailers paid for, get out there and knock doors and things like that. And if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I want to meet with you to talk about healthcare in Arizona. Well, we're going to do it. Um, so I think that's very important for you guys to take that first step because most people down there want to be involved and they want to be active and they want to meet you, period. We you come our way, we will find time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we are all patients. At some point, we will all be caregivers. Daniel, you came to national prominence in an unexpected way in a crisis situation. Um, you're welcome to say what that was. Yeah, so I was very lucky that I attended our great public schools here in Arizona and got trained as a nursing assistant and as a phlebotomist, so I was able to provide first aid back on January 8th of 2011 when Congresswoman Gabby Giffords um, was shot, including you know several others that day. Um, but then, you know, even just recently, I was running around running for office and my dad had MRSA that could not get be treated properly so he had to have an amputated toe because the infection had spread. So multiple times I've had to be a caregiver. I have a pre-existing condition. I've had a thyroid condition since I was 17 and that's a thing where being able to be a legislator who understands both on the patient side but now having to help care for my father and having to work out a very difficult schedule with my sisters who are also elected officials and say, okay, dad has this, uh, uh, a doctor's appointment on 
Tuesday at 10 o'clock and mom can't take him, which one of the other three is going to be able to help make sure that he's not going by himself to this doctor's appointment? And it's so important. And I know, Justin, you've really done some great work, you know, working in your district with, you know, members of your community and helping them and understanding, you know, a lot of the issues that they've been dealing with. Um, relative to affordability and, you know, accumulators and insurance and all of those important things. I, as you look towards this next session, which we fully expect you to be at, um, don't disappoint me. I'll try not to, you know, because she's the most important constituency, right? Period. <laughs> Christopher will tell you that's totally true. A thousand percent? Okay. The, there you go. See, that's on gonna, camera. See, if I don't do that in 2024, she'll come after me. So there you go. Um, you're exactly right. Like for me, like I don't have a health background necessarily other than I was a health policy advisor for a couple of years at the Arizona House and now I'm on the health committee, which is great. My mom's a nurse. So that's really was my, my lifetime of learning uh, through, through that. But it ties into so many things. And my old district, 15, has Mayo Clinic in it. So I had a lot of contacts and conversations with those folks. Uh, the new district's a little smaller because, shocker, people are moving here. Um, but I still have Deer Valley Hospital, which is at 17 and the 101. So um, the biosciences, the health stuff is still very, very important. And the fact is it touches people's budgets. And if there's things that we can do on the state level to fund programs for prevention, I'm all for it because the, the problem that I have on my side, and it's not a problem, I'm a, I'm a small government conservative, but there's also things that we need to be responsible for and we need to address. And if there's an example, like we had this bill this year on a, uh, the diabetes management information for, for those on access, and some in my caucus that were on the committee are like, well, it's like a million dollars, don't vote no. And I'm like, guys, you gotta look at the future, you gotta look five, 10 years down the road. You educate these folks, you tell them that you can solve a lot of this by eating a little less this and a little less that, it's going to save the state untold amounts of money down the, down the road. So when I look at stuff in the health committee, I look for ways to uh, find cost savings in the long, long run, which is very nebulous. But I'm much more a fan of an upfront cost like that, knowing full well that if we can get through to the folks that we're responsible for, it can take care of itself in a lot of ways. So that's the kind of stuff I look for in the health in the health realm. Well, as an economist, I have lots of that really dry data that you love so much, and I'll it. give it to you so you can Deal. use it. Because we need to we need to share that message with folks. Because the, even the average legislator doesn't. They just look at what's in front of them. And I get that. I totally get it. Because we're dealing with you know a fourteen fifteen billion dollar budget. There's a lot of numbers flying around. But if we can make that case for this program, this bill cost this much, yes it does, but over the long run, we expect this kind of a savings. It's a lot easier for, I believe, folks to support. Absolutely. And, and I'll share a quick, dirty little secret about the legislature. I think you all think that the issue that is important to you is important to us. It's not that it's not important, it's that we don't know about it a lot of the times. Because yeah. it may be the number one thing in your life, and it may not be something that I've ever even heard of. So you need to be more proactive, and that's why I think it's so great that we have this network of folks like Joan and others who are coming to us and sharing these stories, because when it's now something that I can put a face to, it is now something that's relevant and I'll dedicate time. But if it's just like this abstract idea that's going into a $15 billion budget, it's really hard to be able to have that be something that I dedicate time and energy when there are 800 bills coming across the House floor or the Senate floor. So just because it's important to you doesn't mean that it's necessarily important to us until you make it. So that's where I always advocate to be proactive, build relationships, and don't wait until you need something on the day of to reach out to us for the first time. Start reaching out early because the more you can build those relationships, the more likely it is to get the attention that it needs and that it deserves. But if it's not being brought forth and it's not something that is relevant to the day-to-day -day work that I'm doing, then I'm going to be like, oh, you know, that's something I can deal with later. But it could be something that's life-changing or something that's really important to countless People in Arizona. Closing thoughts, Justin. Yeah, I would I would add that being a legislator is a lot like being a college student in that if you remember the college schedule, you had this class one to get this class the other. Well, we have usually three committees apiece, usually. I know it varies less to more, but in my case, the past years I was on health, transportation, and commerce, which means any bills that related to obviously health, 
road funding, economic development, that came through guys like me. And my job, first and foremost, was to be educated about bills that came through those three committees. Um, other folks had other committees that dealt with other topics that I didn't deal with until they came to the full house floor. So my focus was always the bills that I ran, the best bills, obviously. The second best bills were the ones in my committee. And then everything else I'd get to later, it's, uh, it's a bit like triage. So going to this understanding when you talk to your elected officials that they've probably got two or three gigantic subject areas they need to know a lot about because their 9 to 13 votes, depending on how big the uh, committee is, drives that policy to the next round. It's like the playoffs. You get out of that, you go to the cow, you go to the floor, and they have a final vote. And then it goes upstairs. So can we please have a round of applause for our panel? And more importantly, a huge round of applause for all of our patient speakers today. This marks the last public event for Arizona Bioscience Week. There were literally thousands of people that were involved in every aspect of that throughout the week. Thank you, Arizona. Thank you to all of our supporters, sponsors that made that possible. And again, um, to the Arizona State Legislature, thank you for my birthday present. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye, everybody. <laughs>